Okay, folks, um, take your seats. And uh, all right, we'll start the afternoon session with uh, Mr. John Brandenburg. And um, hope you guys had a good lunch. I know there's certainly some good discussions going on. And I know that uh, John's always have good for some interesting things as well as how he says them. So I'll turn it over to you, John. Well, thank, thank you very much. And it is a wonderful honor to be here, uh, my friends and colleagues, uh, working on this great intellectual endeavor of really the next generation of space propulsion. And, um, and I want to especially thank Heidi for inviting me and, um, and uh, the inspiration of Jim Woodward uh, for his, uh, his great perseverance in uh, developing his uh, mega thruster. So without further delay, uh, I will be talking, uh, can everybody hear me? Okay, I'll be talking about just pure e and propulsion, uh, which is a goal that I have, and space-time transfers of momentum. Uh, I'll talk about the work I've been doing on uh, gravity electromagnetism unification, which I believe is key to developing this new form of propulsion. Uh, transfers of momentum between e and fields in space-time, the GEM interpretation of the Eagle Works QV thruster, and then I will summarize. So, of course, our overall goal uh, for me is to lower the, significantly lower the cost of a human Mars mission. But to achieve this rather mundane goal of going to this uh, dusty uh, planet over there, we must go to the frontiers of physics. Now, of course, everyone knows that all propulsion involves a momentum exchange with a reaction mass. That is our goal, is to find how to transfer momentum. Uh, we can do this with a pure electromagnetic rocket. It's basically just a power plant, a big light bulb, or we could use uh, solar sails. But basically, we're using uh, the momentum carried by an E&M field as a propulsive uh, rocket thrust, but unfortunately it's 6.7 micro newtons per kilowatt, uh, depending on how reflective your mirror is, of course. So this is not, we can do this theoretically, but it's not practical. Now, the Eagle Works thruster seems to have done something quite different. It emits no E and M radiation. It's a box. We're basically firing microwaves into a box and we're getting thrust out of it without any of the radiation coming out. Conventional E&M theory just suggests all you could basically do is get a warm, pot, warm cup of coffee out of this uh, or some hot metal. Um, it, does, it says that you can fire microwaves into any shape box all day long and you're not going to get anything out of it except some heat. So we have to go beyond present e &M theory to explain what appear to be the quite valid results of the Eagle Works thruster. I visited the site. I looked at their uh, apparatus very carefully. I talked with them. I'm convinced their results are legitimate. I have also, I developed the microwave electrothermal thruster. I know the problems of, of uh, measuring thrust, especially in a vacuum. Um, and it seemed to me they, these people were very professional and they were their own best critics, which is what we have to be if we're going to be experimenting in this. So the Eagle Works thruster emits no E&M radiation, yet develops thrust. It suggests an exchange of momentum with the vacuum itself. How is this possible? Okay, the quantum vacuum explanation suggests that the vacuum has a substance and can be treated as a medium capable of momentum exchange. It suggests this. Quantum, uh, the quantum vacuum is full of E&M waves called ZPF and virtual particle-antiparticle pairs. Conceptually, this means the vacuum is a substance that can exchange momentum with a spacecraft. Um, I say conceptually because I don't the present theory, the reaction of quantum theorists who work with the vacuum is 
I'm being polite, great skepticism <laughs> as to the explanations for being offered for the um, a QV thruster. So, of course, we know that the quantum ZPF is there. We know Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is effective. We also know that we can measure a Casimir force. So that is real. However, we have the calculations for how much uh, energy or mass density are actually, is actually in the vacu uh, vacuum is outrageously wrong. We know that uh, the pure, pure uh, rigorous quantum theory says it should be infinity. The only thing that really saves quantum theory nowadays is the Planck scale, which suggests a cutoff. Uh, they're really mixing gravity into quantum theory when they do that, in my opinion. So, but we know there is a ZPF, and we know that Heisenberg uncertainty principle uh, gives us a vacuum with um, a kind of virtual plasma. However, present quantum theory uh, basically forbids a naive interpretation of the QV thruster, in my opinion. Virtual plasma and ZPF certainly exist. However, present quantum mechanics is consistent with special relativity. The most accurate theory we have in science is quantum electrodynamics, and it's based on the idea that the vacuum is frame independent. That means we can't transfer, the vacuum can't move, we can't transfer momentum to it. So a special relativistic invariance of quantum vacuum says it cannot exchange momentum with matter. Pushing on the vacuum is therefore impossible. In QED, vacuum is not connected to mass, even though a different calculation shows it should have infinite mass. Uh, so. Uh, you'll forgive me for questioning people saying that there's any rigor to these arguments. I mean, we can measure a mass for the vacuum and it's, it's effectively zero. But theory indicates it should be <laughs> an astronomical number. So there's, there's, a, there's a real lack of vigor, in my opinion, in uh, QED right now. But let us say that if we could transfer momentum to this virtual plasma, the world would look a lot different than it does now. So we can have accelerated vacuums. People have been developing theory on that. Hawking evaporation of black holes is based on that. So what, but what is required for pushing on the vacuum to be possible? Well, I have taken a different approach. First of all, in general relativity, we're going far away from quantum physics now. Um, the vacuum is massless, but its geometry is anchored in general relativity to nearby masses. This is a form of Mach's principle. One could argue how much of Mach's principle is involved, but everyone agrees that when you are engaged in space-time, moving along a geodesic, you are connected to the masses that surround you because they determine the space-time geometry. So you can actually say a reaction mass can be connected to the medium of space, space-time, in general relativity. How is that so? Okay, well, everybody knows that if you have an electron and positron orbiting each other, a common center of mass, they're exchanging momentum through the electromagnetic field. The same is also true if two black holes or two, uh, a binary star system, is or they're orbiting a common center of mass. They're exchanging momentum through space-time. So we know from that that space-time can be a medium for momentum transfer because nature does this all the time. Whoops. To make the Eagle Works thruster work, space-time, 
must be somehow electromagnetic so that we can couple to it and transfer momentum to it. We must be able to modify space-time with electromagnetism to exchange momentum with its ma the masses that anchor its structure. What we are doing, in my opinion, when we run a QV thruster, or the Eagle Works thruster, I'll just call it, we are coupling to the masses that surround us through space-time, just as if we were part of a double star system or something like that. Okay, momentum flow in space-time. Momentum flow is not talked about a lot when people talk about general relativity. They say, oh, well, all the particles are moving on geodesics. That's geometry of space-time. They don't connect. I think this leads to a misconception that there is not momentum flow through space-time, but there has to be. However, when they write the equation for a geodesic, the mass doesn't appear. So it looks as though particles move on geodesics independent of their mass. Of course, we have you know, the Leaning Tower of Pizza. Galileo throwing the cannonballs off there. He cleared out of town afterwards very quickly because apparently he put a lot of bets. This is being Italy. And some people were pretty sore at him because he won a lot of money that day, apparently. This is the story I heard. So. However, the fact is, this is where the geometry of space-time comes in, and it depends partly on the mass. So there's where the misconception enters. When the 100-pound and the 10-pound cannonball fall off the Tower of Pizza, the 100-pound cannonball actually does reach the ground a little bit quicker, only a microsecond, perhaps, because the Earth has moved. It's attracted to the, more to the 100-pound cannonball than it is to the 10-pound cannonball. So even though it looks as though they're moving, all the particles are moving the same because they have the same uh, independent of mass, that's, not, that's a misconception. You only clear up this misconception when you add an electromagnetic field to the matter E&M stress tensor in general relativity. And here is the electromagnetic stress tensor. Here's the material uh, part of the stress tensor. And when you then uh, um, derive the equations of motion from this, this part just disappears because you're taking a divergence of both sides. This part just disappears um, because of the Bianchi identities. And this part remains, and when you do this very carefully, you get the mass term, and you define basically a particle, a group, a, a, a mass that all moves uh, without any kind of internal structure. You end up with its mass times its um, acceleration, and you end up with this term times the geodesic equation, and then you end up with the Lorentz force. So the mass cannot be eliminated from the equation anymore. So I would argue that including electromagnetic fields in any view of space-time is the really conceptually correct way to do it. Yes? But if you calculate that, this is a small value. It's infinitesimal. But it's not zero. Yes, but that's, a, <laughs> but that's a very good Jose, this is a very good point. We shall return to it. OK. <laughs> So the mass affects geometry. We all know that infinitesimal is a very subjective term. If something is infinitesimal, it is still non-zero. If you are an infinitesimal being, it could be very large. So if we look at this equation, here is the change of momentum for the particle. Here is the Lorentz force. And here is the change of momentum due to the gravitational fields. And of course, if you do this for just the Lorentz force, two particles and you neglect their gravity, the force on one is 
canceled out by the force on the other, so the total system momentum does not change, and the same thing happens with gravity. So space-time is a medium for momentum transfer. Okay, but again, let's go back to the infinitesimal. The infinitesimal the will be, as I that will be addressed in a minute. No, I'm going to address something different, because we are, talk, we are talking about the value of turn there. You have the tidal force, which uh -huh. you don't have in your equation. The tidal force is much larger. If it's a, if it's a particle, it feels no tidal you, force. You said this experiment that you were talk, uh, throwing things from the Tower of Pisa. Yes. Those, those things, uh, if you try to calculate, the tidal forces on those things is greater than that term that you're saying, the, the electromagnetic term. But if you're a... Uh, the size of a hydrogen atom, the electromagnetic term is dominant. Yeah, I'm saying you ignore the tidal. Uh, uh, the tidal. Well, if it's a, if we if we use the idealization of an infinitesimally sized particle, then there is no tidal force. So, on it. so when you when certainly you, the tidal force is very significant. We're talking about consistency. So you're saying that the electromagnetic term is not zero, but it's an infinitesimal. I'm saying there are other terms. Oh, it's not infinitesimal at all. Hold on a second. There are other terms that you didn't consider, that you neglected, supposedly because you consider them to be small. One of them is the tidal force. I had the occasion of falling off a roof when I was helping to resurface the roof of my family house, and I fell off the roof. Fortunately, I landed pretty much on my feet. I was stopped in my free fall on a geodesic by electromagnetic forces of the concrete. You ran into a power line? <laughs> <laughs> no, I ran into a bunch of charged particles. <laughs> and they stopped me. So this, those electromagnetic fields were not infinitesimal. But, but the, the, what I'm saying is... Not Let us speak of the infinitesimal nature of the Planck scale. You ignore terms that are larger than the electromagnetic field there. Depends on your frame of reference. No. Yes. There are tidal forces that you ignore are larger than those electromagnetic Not forces. if the particles are the size of a proton. But, but the, the, you are talking about the tower of If you're the Pisa. size of a proton, then... I didn't know you were throwing protons from the tower of Pisa. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to throw a black hole of a Chandrasekhar mass from the tower of Pisa. Then what happens? A hundred pound cannonball and a... Chandrasekhar mass black hole thrown off the Tower of Pizza. The Chandrasekhar mass will hit the ground, from my point of view, much more quickly than the 100 pound cannonball because the Earth will rise to meet it. So that's what I mean when I say that saying everything moves on geodesics so you can ignore mass. This is not. This is a misconception. Yes. Yeah, actually, the, the geodesics are only true for point particles anyway. Yes. That's what I mean. That's, I think that's what he means. I'm, 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 I'm arguing based on point particles. But no, Jose, your point is well taken. The tidal forces are very important. But you mentioned, but what he said, he was talking about the experiment from the Tower of Pizza. Okay, so, that's a finite sized particle, not just a problem. Right. So I didn't know if he was throwing protons. Anyway. I am throwing protons. Right. So, now, the Planck scale, of course, is where we now include general relativity in quantum mechanics. People say, oh, you can't do general relativity in quantum mechanics. We're doing it all the time with the Planck scale because, of course, we have the, um, whoops, we have the Planck mass and we have the Planck scale, which I refer to to my students in my physics class as the pixel size of the great virtual reality that we live in. It's got great graphics. <laughs> so, a ZPF Planck scale, our quantum black holes and Planck mass, uh, MP, they annihilate at the Planck length. So this action makes space-time a foam. So we, this is the natural um, size scale for any, to begin any theory of trying to understand the electro, interaction of electromagnetism with um, space-time. Okay, now, 
Einstein, of course, made this his great quest. He worked on it till the day of his death. His last request to his friends was to bring all his notes to his deathbed. In fact, they say he jumped up and began speaking excitedly in German to his nurse and then went back and laid in his bed with a big smile on his face and, and went to sleep and never woke up. And the nurse did not speak any German. So, but he wanted to relate the electromagnetic stress tensor, the ele I'm sorry, the electromagnetic tensor, the Faraday tensor, somehow to the metric tensor. He was also a big fan of the uh, two-particle paradigm, that hydrogen was the basic stuff of the universe and everything else was details. You can imagine how annoying this was to everyone who was looking at quarks and uh, everything else and nuclear physics because uh, he wasn't really very interested in it. He said, it's, I have, must explain hydrogen. Where did the hydrogen come from? So his basic work was to try to relate the metric tensor to the E and M tensor and to try to explain how somehow from the vacuum the proton and the electron had emerged at the Big Bang at the moment of creation in a plus and minus charge. And he tried many, many different ways to do this. All of them were unsuccessful. He rejected quantum mechanics. So this was a great tragedy, despite the fact that he had helped invent quantum mechanics. Um, Oppenheimer, his boss at Institute for Advanced Study, finally said of Einstein, he is in cloud cuckoo land. This speaks of their relationship, I guess. Um, so his, his effort was unsuccessful, at least as far as we know, but he discovered the ZPF, and he helped Kaluza-Klein theory get published. Now, Kaluza-Klein, as you know, is the idea that there are not just four dimensions of space-time, there's a hidden fifth dimension. Now, I have come here to talk about my own work on this kind of quest begun by Einstein. I have concluded that Einstein was correct in his main concepts. This is the relationship between the metric tensor and the field tensor that I have derived. It has the very interesting property that it makes the ZPF, the mass of the vacuum, vanish because the stress tensor for the ultra strong fields. Now, on my view, this applies to very, very strong fields down near the Planck length. But it is still a relationship between the metric tensor and the field tensor. So you can imagine that E and M fields can directly affect the structure of space-time, not just through the mechanism of, G, of the big G in the uh, Einstein equation. And also, the goal of my uh, theory was, or the postulate, was that gravity and E&M e &M forces and protons and electrons separate from the Planck scale. So that the birth of separate, a separate E&M force from gravity is coupled very closely in a mathematical sense to the appearance of the proton and the electron from the Planck scale as a pair of particles with opposing charges. But we have suddenly the appearance of a new mass scale and a new size scale which is the, of course, at the Planck scale, uh, if there's a hidden dimension, it's just the size of the Planck scale. That doesn't do anything. The hidden dimension must no longer be infinitesimal. It must be large, physically large, compared to the Planck scale. Otherwise, it wouldn't change any of the physics. We would just end up with an empty vacuum at the Planck scale. So let us, let us postulate that gravity and M forces and protons and electrons separate together from the Planck scale. E and M appears from the Planck scale along with the proton-electron pair and their mass scale. As I said, 
our goal is just to get a practical propulsion system to the rest of the solar system, but we have to engage in a deep journey to the frontiers of physics to do this. So, in brief, I'm a plasma physicist. Yes? Uh, on the previous slide. In brief? Sorry? Briefly? On the previous slide. Yes. The metric tensor, you relating it to the... Uh, Faraday Faraday tensor. To the Faraday tensors. Yes, Einstein said that the two were like the same and that the, the, this meant that the metric had sort of a twist to it because the Faraday tensor is anti-symmetric, the metric tensor is symmetric. So my, in my theory you have a symmetric tensor. And I will show you the physical meaning of this now. But uh, you didn't ask my question. I just said that you're relating it to it and then yes. you started talking and at the end. Yes, yes. I'm going to show you what this means. Okay, now, I'm a plasma physicist, a theoretical plasma. I was working on the problem of controlled thermonuclear fusion. Let me ask you the question. The, the, so, when you're writing that the metric tensor is equal to the uh, Faraday uh, tensor, I think you have right. the mixed component divided by the contraction. Contraction. Uh, the, the, uh, what happens with, is that in the absence of any matter around? Because uh, what happens? Yes, yeah, so let's consider matter to be, what we call matter to be just a small perturbation on space time, that the real action is down at the, near the Planck scale. So that equation gives you a vanishing of the stress tensor of the ZPF. But the question is, uh, the, in the usual uh, solution where you, you have a, a, a metric solution, which would be the Schwarzschild uh, met metric, for example. Yeah. Then uh, how? What? What does your metric? Is that uh, do you add both metrics? What? What? I, with I will show you where this leads. Okay. So we have gravity equivalent to an array of what are called E cross B drifts. How many people know what that is? It is very well known in plasma physics. Excuse me, John, I'm going to I'm going to fire up the dial and someone's trying to call in to listen to your talk, okay? But go ahead and keep talking. I'm honored. <laughs> Hopefully it is not a crank call. <laughs> but an E cross B drift, which I will show you, affects all particles the same regardless of charge or mass. Okay, and gravity and E and M forces separate from the uh, Planck scale vacuum with the appearance of the, and what you call the deployment. Imagine like an opening umbrella of the fifth dimension. <laughs> I hope these people are very persistent. There, I don't think they're very persistent. Hopefully they're not going to try and sell me a vacation to Hawaii, as many of my other callers have tried to do recently. I somehow got on their list. Jose, the infinitesimal. Let us return to that while we figure this out. Infinitesimal, you must admit, is a subjective term. If something is infinitesimal, it's generally considered a speck of dust to us human beings. And we are certainly aware that tidal forces can tear people apart. You can give them a running commentary, Craig. Sorry about that, John. <laughs> Pardon me. Anyway, the theory is a formal combination of the ZPF gravity concept of Zakharov and the fifth dimensional concept of Kaluza-Klein and results in what I call a vacuum Bernoulli equation and a calculation for uh, Newton's constant that's good to within a part per 10,000. I wrote a book on this, which you can get from uh, Lambert uh, Publishing on Amazon.com. Um, 
This is Sakharov's concept of gravity based on the ZPF. That the, If you put two bright objects in a dark box, they will repel each other due to mutual radiation pressure. However, it's not well known that if you put two dark objects in a bright box, they will attract each other as long as they're far away with a 1 over r squared force. And so Sakharov's idea was that the ZPF was the radiation bath. He was working on the Russian hydrogen bomb at the time, so he could not be he could not explain in great detail what his idea was because he had to get it past the Russian, uh, the KGB, basically, um, their classification system. So the pointing vector, S equals E cross B times C in ESU units, defines the direction of radiation pressure. So what these particles are seeing is converging uh, pointing vector. Now. What do we mean? Let's see, where is the. I'm just going to zip ahead here. Here is an E cross B drift. If you have two plates with a magnetic field coming out of the board, then, and an electric field between the two plates, then every particle you drop in here will end up at the same drift speed, regardless of charge or mass. Obviously, it has to have some charge, and obviously, mass can't be enormous. But it's a very interesting effect in plasma physics that's not widely known outside of plasma physics. But we looked at this all the time in order to confine particles for thermonuclear fusion. Now, if you change this slightly from two parallel plates, and you add variation, so the plates are tilted to each other and drop a, a two charged particles in here of any charge or mass, they will both fall together, they will accelerate. Or you can actually uh, vary the electric field between the plates with a sawtooth and you will get the same effect. You will get an acceleration. The magnetic field stays static in this case, in both cases. So you can accelerate all charged particles regardless of their mass. They all fall together. And this, so this satisfies sort of an equivalence principle. And not only that, if you are riding on that particle with an electric field meter, the electric field vanishes in that frame because it's Lorentz shifted. You're traveling at just the right speed, as it turns out, to make the local electric field disappear and the magnetic field disappears also. So this satisfies an equivalence principle. It's easy to simulate this. This is just a particle simulator. And we dropped a proton, no, it's an electron and a heavy, uh, let's see, it was a heavy positron, like 30 masses, 30 electron masses, and let them fall. And they both fell together. So we have at least for kind of small numbers of charged particles in a small region, a model of what a gravity field looks like in terms of electromagnetism. So this, and if you look at where the S vector is, it points down here. So the pointing vector, E cross B, always points in the direction of the particles falling. So. Now, um, here's Sakharov's theory of gravity. He took what's called the Hilbert action principle, where you can derive Einstein's equations, at least for a vacuum, from this simple, you're maximizing uh, this action, which is the Ricci scalar. And uh, he imagined the, he uh, put in a uh, spectrum for the ZPF, which is Lorentz invariant and uh, ended up with calculating a value of g, which unfortunately involves g because it involves the Planck length here. So that it's, it's sort of a circular argument, but it is at least self-consistent. Now, here's the action principle for a vacuum region. 
using um, Kaluza Klein, which has a hidden fifth dimension. Here is the um, contraction of the E&M e &M tensor, and here is the Ricci scalar, and here's the hidden dimension size, and one ends up very nicely with the E&M tensor. And if one integrates both sides, then one can get the Lorentz force on a particle. So this extended action principle from the Hilbert action principle was discovered by Kaluza and Klein to give um, Einstein's equations for gravity and Maxwell's equations for E and M. That's the only way I know of to get um, the coupled E and M and general relativistic equations by invoking a fifth dimension. So we have the hidden dimension size in my theory, which is depends on the uh, mass of the proton, mass of the electron, c squared. So I'm allowing this hidden dimension to deploy, or rather inflate from the um, uh, Planck scale and then stop. So it, it deploys basically like an opening umbrella and then stops. And um, so it ends up with gravity fields uh, and the proton mass and the electron mass from this scheme. Now, we can go look from the other direction. Let's say if we took a proton and electron and shrunk them in a uh, sphere. And of course, due to Heisenberg uncertainty, as they rattle around in here, as we constrict their spatial extent, they're going to ionize. They're going to form a plasma. And then finally, down near the Planck scale, they're going to form a black hole, which then, according to Hawking, evaporation will evaporate into charged particles, uh, well, particles and antiparticles. The original electron and proton are gone. The baryon lepton number have disappeared. And are evaporated the photons. Uh, well, yes, and also the photons, if you have enough photons, some of them will form uh, uh, particles and antiparticles, pairs. So the, the end result will be just photons, yes. So the idea is that the uh, baryon number and the lepton number have disappeared in this process. So it becomes a black hole. So the original hydrogen is lost in this Gedanken experiment. So let's try and figure out, suppose the, we imagine that the proton and electron merged smoothly at the Planck length. They became each other's antiparticles. They assumed the same mass. So the mass of the proton, the mass of the electron, this became one, meaning this angle in this uh, um, linear kind of model became zero. Whereas at our present day with the, dis the um, present day universe with the fifth dimension deployed, it makes a number called sigma, which is about 42.85. Now, the way we can make this happen smoothly at least until we get very close to the uh, Planck length, is to have the size of the uh, hidden dimension versus the Planck length equal to the mass of the proton over the mass electron on the square root. So it ends up being 42.8503. And as this uh, the size of the hidden dimension shrinks to the Planck length. This just goes to uh, something near one and finally zero. Um, we have to adjust, by the way, this simple equation to account for the fact that it has to vanish. Both sides have to vanish identically at R zero over RP equals one. And if we look at this ratio, the way we have defined the um, the hidden dimension size is depending on the mass of the proton, the mass of the electron, then we end up saying that the ratio of sizes is in fact the ratio uh, or the square root of the ratio of the 
uh, electric and gravitational forces between like a proton and an electron. The number, this is uh, 10 to the uh, about 20, negative 24, or no, it's 10 to the 24, where it is, and this is, uh, has a normalization of a fine structure constant, indicating that uh, in this model, uh, gravity is linked to electromagnetism because through the quantum fine structure constant. So this is what we end up with. We get very, we can invert that formula and get the equation for the gravitation constant and it's within a part per thousand, uh, it's now to within a part per 10,000 after we make adjustments near the um, Planck length. And also we extend our model to find out where we got M0 and it turns out we can then calculate the mass of the proton from the vacuum, from the Planckian vacuum. So we get both big G and the mass of the proton, uh, really the ratio of the mass of the proton to the Planck mass from the vacuum by a fairly, fairly straightforward process. So I'm very pleased by that. Um, then we have an electromagnetic model of gravity. And so that is basically the starting point for trying to figure out how we can turn this into some kind of propulsion technology. If we can, if we say that E and M and gravity are two aspects of the same phenomenon related through a fifth dimension, then we have hope that we can modify gravity, modify space-time with electromagnetism and create propulsive forces. So we have, of course, here is the equation. Now, if we go to the limit of non the non-relativistic limit, this becomes a very simple expression. I guess this is for the Newtonian gravity potential. It's an electric field squared over a B squared. This also satisfies this E cross B drift model of gravity. The uh, metric tensor in terms of the E and M tensor looks like this. E squared dominates the uh, Newtonian part. Of, this is normally the part of the um, stress tensor uh, the, or the metric tensor rather that gives us the Newtonian gravity potential and the other terms are relativistic corrections. Now if we take this term and insert it into here we find that this term always cancels this term so the vacuum ZPF the problem of the infinite energy in the vacuum predicted by quantum mechanics vanishes at zero. So we have a vacuum that weighs nothing in my theory. Or not just infinitesimal, but zero. Well, I, I still don't, you have the metric given by the Faraday tensor. Right. But uh, the metric normally when we're dealing with matter around us is, is the uh, metric that is governed for some... From the general relativistic equations, yeah. So this, is the, this is for... Uh, my interpretation of this is that this expression applies kind of in the very deep energy scales near the Planck scale, far, far uh, higher energy scales or energy densities that are seen even in subatomic particles. Um, and that's so that matter, in a sense, is just a tiny perturbation on, on the vacuum. The vacuum, for the most part, just ignores matter. And the general relativistic equations only apply to basically what we, um, they are the leftovers of this process. So uh, I will just make a very quick scholarly digression. I have a mass, mo I developed a mass model to predict the mass of the proton from the Planck scale, and unexpectedly, it gave the masses of the pions and the W and Z particles. They just sort of fell out. 
And so I, of course, rushed out and published that wherever I could. So uh, the Higgs mass falls out similarly. Um, and I found that four months before it was announced. So, so I'm very pleased. And this gives me uh, great confidence. Uh, by the way, the exchange protons are what you would call me scatterings. In German, Gustav Me, is that I'm pronouncing his name correctly? M I E? My scattering? Me scattering? Me. Me? Yeah, me. me. That's what to my understanding. So, um, Anyway, I'm very pleased. The uh, numbers are quite accurate. The bottom line is that one can take this equation for the Kaluza-Klein action and by several different pathways end up with this equation for a Newtonian gravity field related to a pointing field and a background uh, magnetic fields, and this is called the vacuum Bernoulli equation. So basically what we are saying is gravity fields, the energy in a gravity field, can be related to a electromagnetic energy density that has to do with the pointing field. And even though this by itself does not satisfy an equivalence principle, because their sh gravity should not have an energy density. If we have these two things coupled together, then in accelerated frames, these both, these always cancel each other, and this especially, the E cross B vanishes along with the gravity. So this expression does seem to follow an equivalence principle, as it must. But it is kind of the non-relativistic limit of the Kaluza-Klein action. And it says that electromagnetic gravity modification is possible. Now, that is our goal. So we have a theory that seems to suggest it satisfies certain constraints that we, certain common sense tests and it says that we can apply an E and M field in some box and modify the local space-time structure so that the whole box will feel a gravity force. Now, this um, vacuum Bernoulli equation was first published by myself and John Klein, no relation to Kaluza and Klein. Uh, but he was my co-worker, a brilliant man, at joint, and we published it at the Joint Propulsion Conference in uh, 1998. And I can make that. Uh, we had basically published this because the Japanese, Hasaka and Takaguchi, reported that when they spun a gyroscope using three-phase um, rotating power, invented by Tesla, if they spun a rotor counterclockwise, it would lose weight the faster it spun. But if they spun it in the counterclockwise, if the clockwise direction, left rotation, it weight was undisturbed. Uh, I was fortunate to work with a, a scholar of very obscure literature who was a computer kind of gamesman person where I worked, and he says, oh, the Russians reported that. This was reported by a fellow named Kazarev. Exactly the same results. So we got some money together uh, from a person who was interested in these things and tested it with an aviation gyroscope and found the same result. It wasn't as strong as it was reported by the Japanese and the Russians, but we saw it. Then, I think it was in physical review. And that's right. And you, that's, I thought it was not verified. I thought a whole lot of people. Oh, yes. It. You didn't read very carefully the article that debunked it. The article that debunked it was a separate, a different experiment. It was, it was, a, it was they, ran this, they, they ran this gyroscope on compressed air, not Tesla fields. Yeah, they, didn't, they didn't repeat the experiment. Before. They did not. We repeated the experiment as precisely as we could. Because right, these guys had to publish in another journal because 
somebody debunked it, you doing a totally different experiment. It's, yeah. it's an embarrassment. To, it was an embarrassment. It was, an embarrassment. It was not a science. It was not a good day for American science. Yeah. Has anybody run this in the Southern Hemisphere? <laughs> I actually applied for money to run this in Rio de Janeiro during Carnival. <laughs> <laughs> but my request for funding was rejected. Uh, now, what happened then is we took the rotor out and found out... Just to add, I, mean, I made the same comment before, but just to clear up, right? I think there have been six or seven replications, including a Japanese group who did exactly the same as the Japanese did. And even myself, and I published a whole paper about error sources of what you can um, miss with making gyroscope uh, measurements. So it's all vibration artifacts. Um, yeah. Thank you, Just, Martin. Yeah, OK, good. When I get to Mars. I will wave. Watch for me. I will wave uh, because chance not only favors the prepared mind, as Pastor said, it favors the visionary. If you believe that there is a way that we can modify space time with electromagnetism, I'm not saying it's through my theory, maybe through some other theory, then your road to the stars is open. But if you insist on believing that this, such ideas are nonsense, then you will go no place. There. Uh, we stand by our results. And we took out the rotor to avoid vibration. And we got an even stronger effect without the rotor. And it went as the voltage to the fourth power. I won't go into all, we tried to be our very best critics in this, because we knew how outrageous this result was. I don't understand, if you take out the rotor, what's left? Just the fields, so have, the rotating fields. You have a three-phase field going around the yep. that. Yep, 400 one. hertz. Did you check the magnetic influence on the balance? Yes. And? With zero. Okay. We hung the coil one millimeter over the scale and turned it on and off. The scale was completely unaffected. We tried to be our own best critics, Martin. I'm only a theorist, so naturally my attempts at experimental work were clumsy. So I was extra careful not to do anything stupid especially if I was going to go to a big conference and present my results. And worse yet, ask for money to go to Rio de Janeiro during Carnival to repeat this experiment. <laughs> so this is a approximately V to the fourth is what we saw. We have recently repeated this experiment. I'm trying to get this thing to uh oh. Where's the mouse? Ah, there's the mouse. Where's the volume control? Oh, you have a. Well, we recently repeated the experiment. Created a black hole. <laughs> As you can see, we created a black hole. Black box radiation. Um, let's see here. So what does your theory predict for a magnetar? Uh, oh, it be well, it does predict that if two black holes collide, you will get a gamma ray burst, even if it's bare space. You will rip space apart into positron and electron pairs, and you will get a gamma ray burst, even for two big black holes. None of these LIGO black hole uh, merges that have been accompanied by, by gamma ray bursts. Well, there was a report, the report. The neutron star was, but not the Yeah, uh, not the I, black I hole understand or. that. And there was, there was, the initial report was, there, some people reported there was a gamma ray burst, other people said there wasn't, so. But, but have you look at the magnetar? Let's see. Uh, a magnetar 
that is a highly magnetized, uh, that's a... Just a neutron star with a very strong magnetic field. Mm -hmm. I have not, unfortunately, looked at that case. Um, is, the, is it a separate file, John, or is it... A yeah, I'm just run, gonna run it as a separate file yeah. here. Hold on just a second. Okay, there's the scale. It's set to go. tear. There's the coil inside. On. These are liquid metal contacts right. meant to avoid any uh, interference. There you go. This was done obviously on low budget. Right. We're, we're repeating work that we did 17 right. years ago. So that's what go. it looks like. I tell people don't pack your right. bags for Mars yet. All right. But uh, anyway, what was the tear wheel? There you go. Device. What's that? Well, the tear, tear, tear just means that you set I mean, this. What was it? Oh, it was like 60 grams. Okay. I'll be. Uh, we'll be publishing this result so everybody can do this. This costs next to nothing to do yeah. this. You have a coil in there that you power. Yes. And it changes weight. Yes. At least oh. according to the scale. Sure. That's why I'm saying, did you try to and of course, look, put new metal around I'm sorry, Martin, Martin, yeah. I know that you think this is nonsense, that this is impossible. I, I, I know I you think that, and this, this is an impediment. Thinking things are impossible is an impediment to discovering <laughs> things. Well, it's not impossible. I, I've been doing this myself, so I, I know that if you put new metal shield around it, you won't measure anything. Uh, 17 years ago, we did a quite extensive investigation of this to try and rule out all possible errors. We were also running the microwave electrothermal thruster, which at the same time, so we knew how to run a thruster experiment in a vacuum, and and so and eliminate you know Lorentz forces and coil. Yes, I'm what, sorry. What was in the container? It's just a coil. I'm sorry. The the, the my friend set up this experiment in his own household laboratory. We were repeating work that was done 17 years ago. And he, he used a, rather than using a clear plastic thing so you could see what it looks like, it's just a simple coil from a model airplane, a, 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 a rotor, a electric motor, three-phase motor for electric airplanes. So it's like a, like a, all right, so yeah, it's very simple. Like I'll, I'll, I'll try and give you guys all of the... Uh, stuff so you can repeat this experiment. We got we did it with a Sperry gyroscope. So why would the magnetic field generated from that not interact with the scale? Uh, the scale all we did all we did is we, we, we hung the coil we hung the coil one millimeter above so it wasn't touching. Okay. Well, and we turned it on and off and it didn't do anything. Okay. It didn't change the ter it we also uh, we uh, okay. John Klein also uh, arranged to hang the coil over here and by a pulley system connect it to a weight on the scale so the two were quite separated and run it and he got the same weight loss. So we, we were trying to rule out all possible errors. I mean, I actually got all excited in an experiment where I thought I'd reduced the weight of a lead weight with a... Um, a rotating field. It was after this one. I thought I could do this with anything, and it turned out I'd put an iron screw in the. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so, and one of my friends pointed this out. He said, "John, I just saw you screw the thing together with a screw. Was it brass or steel?" And I said, "Oh my God, it was steel." So, we withdrew our publication from FizRev Letters after that. <laughs> Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, doesn't the balance work with a magnet inside? No, no, no. That's it's a, just a load cell. What? Is what? It's Sartorius. Sure. It, that's what it uh, read, read the manual. Read the manual. Yep. Yep. Well, <laughs> they 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 are they. In other words, they are levitating it with a lens uh, lenses law. It's um yeah it's a, it's um, um zero uh, displacement balance. Uh huh. So it's a closed. So it, it's, it's a closed loop, 
So you're measuring deflection and there's an electromagnet that tries to put it in place. So if well, you put a coil up there, then you will see bogus values. Well, um, we hung all of these coils under balloons and charged them. And the, you know, the balloon would, the, the coil would lo appear to lose weight, pulling the wires off the floor to find a new well, equilibrium point. What? The, the coil gets hot when it's hot. Oh, I know it gets hot. That's why we hung resistor sets to make sure that the temperature oh, yeah. was not uh, the temperature. And we watched that. Uh, that caused it, the balloons to move around, but it didn't change the equilibrium point. So no, we tried to be our very best critics. We had a group of very smart people working on this. I'm just presenting what we saw. Now, the working hypothesis. Yes, we're here. I'm sorry. Just, just a quick question. Um, so you just had a simple coil that you energized with a power source and it got yeah. lighter? It's like an induction motor coil. Did you try this with different kinds of coils? To see oh, yes, yes. One coil we tested had no metal enclosure and it got heavier. Did you and, flip uh, polarity? So we, what? Did you flip the polarity? What's that? Did you flip the polarity? Uh, yes, we flipped the polarity. There's the, the polarity matter. difference doesn't doesn't matter once you take out the rotor. I so, do I understand that? No, I do not. I'm at this point. I'm kind of reporting phenomenology, and we keep our our pulses to short pulses to avoid thermal effects. Um, so this is what we got 17 years ago and reported at the AIAA. Switch the three phase so it goes this way versus that way. Yes, yes, it made no difference. It's, it's still lost. But uh, we did another experiment where we, um, um, we changed the, the mass arrangement around the coil and it got heavier instead of lighter. So uh, that was very interesting. Um, anyway, the working hypothesis is uh, that we are seeing a gem effect in the QV thruster. Uh, of course, this is Shayer's result, and we must give Shayer credit, even if no one <laughs> believes his own explanation for this. It's like Columbus. He discovered two new continents, but didn't realize, he thought he'd discovered Asia. And um, it, took, uh, it took the Portuguese to figure out, basically, that it was new continents. So um, it's also reported that the Wright brothers did not know anything about the Bernoulli equation when they did their, they basically had a wind tunnel and they had bird wings. And that's how they designed their airplane. Could you go back to full screen mode? Oh, yes, yes, I'm terribly sorry. Um, so how am I doing on time? I don't want to run over. I know we're critical on time. So I will quickly just say that Shayer deserves credit for reporting what looks like a crazy result, but other people are now verifying. And the, at least without dielectric, if you put dielectric in there, then it's no longer, it's more difficult to, for me to figure out what's going on. But without a dielectric, the force should be in the direction of where the strongest electric field is. So that's my prediction. There, from, there's a number of experiments that show the force in the opposite direction. Um, the devil, you say. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, all I can say is that, in my theory at least, the strong region of the strong electric field should be the region that creates the, whoops, Back up, got the force going the wrong way here. Should be the direction of the force, but um, we'll have to do some experimenting. And um, all I can say is in my theory, using the uh, Bernoulli equation, what's that? Which way does the force go, according to your theory? Uh, according to my theory, it should go to the big end, if there's no dielectric in there. If you put dielectric in there, you're obviously changing the electric field arrangement, and um, my theory is basically a theory of vacuum. No, wait a minute. We have to be careful because when you're saying that, you're considering a specific mode, right? You're specific. Uh, yes, I am considering. A, I'm, I'm considering the, the mode that creates a big electric field concentration here. Sure. 
as opposed to here, and that should be the direction of the force, according to my theory. But you're considering the, the B uh, lines to be uh, going around the circularly? Uh, yes. It's, let me put it this way. In the low energy, in the low intensity limit that the people are working with in Houston, which is the uh, hardware I'm most familiar with, they are basically perturbing fields that are responsible for the Earth's gravity effects, according to my theory. And the way I calculated, we should be getting about 0.2 microwatts per watt in this low intensity limit. They observe about 0.7, so that's not so bad. Now, my theory also predicts that if you raise the intensity, you will go to a nonlinear limit where the fields impressed in the uh, chamber will actually be stronger because of high Q effects and things like that than the gravity field, the, the pointing vector in the vacuum ZPF associated with the Earth's gravity. And you will get a nonlinear limit that will go as thrust equals power squared. Rather than being linear with power, it should go as power squared. And we should be getting about 0.27, a quarter of a Newton per kilowatt, which is pretty good. And this should go even higher if we put even more energy into this thing. Now, these are, I will, I will confess, this is all quite primitive at this point. I am like the first person trying to explain the Wright brothers' flight using the Bernoulli equation. And uh, um, so I have a, a theory that is sort of rudimentary at this point, I will be freely admit. And we have some interesting experiments. And I seem to, I think I can explain the experiments based on my theory. And this also predicts a much more effective um, thrust per unit of power at higher intensities. So this shows that we do have the possibility of flying around the solar system. You're assuming you're putting in 60 megawatts or something? Yeah, just uh, a lot. <laughs> but take a nuclear reactor along. <laughs> or Hoover Dam. <laughs> Hoover Dam is my favorite. Uh, there was one idea for a plasma thruster that had so much, required so much power. I said, well, we'll just assume that we're carrying Hoover Dam along with the, uh, the crew. And, um, but anyway, uh, this is what I think is going on. We are creating kind of gravitational lines of force, pushing this way, pulling the whole housing. We put a lead plate on there. It actually should increase the force, but of course it will increase the weight. Um, so that there is a force, thrust force, and then a reaction force that's affecting the surrounding matter. And this would also explain why in some experiments we would try and make coils that would get lighter. Instead, they would get heavier. And uh, the first liquid metal contact experiments worked like that because we'd put so much mass around everything to hold all the liquid metal and everything. So uh, working hypothesis, the Eagle Works thruster is modifying space time with E&M fields and transferring momentum to nearby masses, the Earth, the Moon, the Sun, according to the, according to the GEM theory. Predictions, thrust will be proportional to power squared at higher powers, ki above kilowatts, kilowatt levels and higher. And opposing forces will be found near the Eagle Works thruster during its operation, indicating transfer of momentum to other masses. So if we put little force sensors around the Eagle Works thruster, away from it, we should get a kind of back force that is uh, created by the kind of return of the kind of dipole pattern of uh, Newtonian gravity fields. Okay, so John, you have this tested. We can zip around the solar system. The Jetsons flying car is my model for. Okay. 
what about the interstellar space? The oh, that's that's a different kettle of fish. That's this is really bending space time. That's you know Einstein roads and bridges and things. That's changing the basic topology of space time. Oh, no, no, just, just uh, you know, this should work in a deep space. Yes. What changes? You don't have the sun and the moon to, to deposit momentum to. What, where, where does the... Um, I'm not sure. Okay. I don't have the... I, I just worry about near Earth right now and, you know, the next planet out, which is Mars and Venus. How, uh, how did you Venus. eliminate all the magnetic forces? For example, we're still within the magnetic force of the Van Allen belt which, on Earth. There's a gravitational uh, field. Oh, there are obviously complications of putting up a big magnetic field around a satellite or, or doing this. But the Eagle Works thruster is nice because it's just microwaves, and we just fire them into a can, and we don't have to really worry about the electromagnetic environment outside. The, the Earth's magnetic field in Van Allen shouldn't affect its operation. It's the uh, Eagle Works type or Shea or thruster in space. It shouldn't be affected. At least I don't think so. But anyway, in summary, a modern theory of the vacuum does not preclude Q thrusters or E and M modification of space-time. It doesn't. It's not very encouraging, but it doesn't really preclude them. And then, small anomalous forces seen in experiments may be signs of QV thruster or gem thrusters. I believe that are. I believe they are. So. These small anomalous forces we're seeing, I believe, do represent a breakthrough. And we should be trying to uh, refine this. And uh, gem unification theory can explain the forces, magnitudes, and phenomenology seen in the experiments to a certain degree. So gem predicts nonlinear limit and, re and reaction forces. We should be able to see reaction forces in the environment. Yes? So if you were to test this between Earth and Mars. Yes. Would you expect to see a delay in the propulsion once the power is turned on, since you're looking at exchanging with exchange. momentum with some nearby mass, but if you're not near any masses, would you expect a delayed propulsive? I think, I, I, you know, I'm not sure. My, my intuitive answer to that, that this is rather kind of Machian, and does it really kind of matters, cares more about the whole structure of space time rather than just the local, but I'm not sure. We'll have to we'll have to do that experiment. So in my opinion, breakthroughs, experimental and theoretical, have occurred. Whether uh, my own theory will be included in that, I don't know. And whether the Eagle, but I do believe the Eagle works thruster and the mega thruster are giving us a new uh, new breakthroughs in propulsion. So uh, I would have liked to have, I'd like to thank uh, Jim for being my constant inspiration in this and Heidi. Uh, I also uh, wish I had applied my theory to your mega thruster, but my theory works best when there's no matter and your thing is full of matter. <laughs> so I, I just offer that lame apology for uh, but anyway, um, thank you very much for your attention. And we have five minutes for Q&A, and then I think maybe a, a break, or do you want to yeah, go straight into yours? Yeah, a break. Okay, so five minutes for questions for John. Fire away, Jose. Yeah, so, okay, so all right. <laughs> Jose shows <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so to recapitulate, correct me if I'm wrong, to interpret what you're saying, the metric tensor relationship to the Faraday tensor applies in, in the very small scale? Uh, I think that, uh, you know, there is, you could actually sort of say that the, yeah, that this equation applies most strongly in vacuum at very high energy scales. Obviously, the Einstein equations 
give you everything you need to know to calculate a metric at ordinary every day. Uh, but of course, that presumes that the vacuum has no mass, and uh, this takes care of the vacuum mass. And uh, I'm going to ask you for a guesstimate, and, it, and it's not to, it's not to, um, and the reason for this, it has nothing to do, with, not to trip you or anything. Sure. It's because I, I, at lunch time, uh, Martin and I were having a discussion about characteristic lengths. So, just what, uh, what, uh, what uh, uh, lens do you think that? Uh, uh, one will go from the area of applicability of this metric tensor to the one where uh, normal general relativity occurs. Well, I think I think the above the I think below the the size scale for the hidden dimension in this thing is about um, smaller than it's a slight it's a it's 43 times smaller than the classical radius of an electron. Uh, so I would imagine that this starts applying then. Um, um, that's just my guesstimate. Uh, so, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, you have a question? Yeah. Uh, just, just really quickly, did you ever try that, that coil experiment using a, uh, uh, a very high quality um, balance scale rather than a digital scale? Uh, yes, yes we did. The first time we did it was with a balance scale. We had a very we had a, we had a chemistry department that did not want its milligram sensitive balance scale anymore because it wanted to because it was big and bulky. So then we we bounced laser beams down the hall so we could see tiny reflections. It was a nightmare of an experiment because there were so many, but we finally saw the same effect, and so we we tried to. We tried to eliminate any crosstalk between the electric magnetic fields of the coil and and the um, um, you know the scale, and we in fact we finally separated them and then we had a pulley system that was they made the a fr pulley system with Teflon bearings and everything it was as frictionless as possible and they saw then the same effects. Because I think I think the digital scale showed something like 17 or 18 gram difference. Milligrams. Milli oh, that was, yeah, those are milli those are milligrams. I was counting okay. decimals over there too. I was like, wait, where's the decimal point? Yeah, the oh, decimal point. Okay. Yeah. So that what you saw was about a 17 milligram weight change, and we deliberately kept the pulses short so that to avoid thermal. If you heat any coil long enough, it will get lighter because it will start evaporating oils and stuff like this. <laughs> and um, so, but anyway. Thank you very much, and thank you, Greg, for the great honor of being able to come here and uh, give this presentation. Okay. Thanks again, John. <laughs>